mountains of golden sand undulating off as far as the eye can see, like waves in the ocean. This is the Rub al Khali, the empty quarter, a desert larger than all of France, located in the center of the Arabian Peninsula. This was the birthplace of Islam, in an oasis tucked away in one of the world's cruelest deserts, but which opens onto both the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. At the crossroads of the Mediterranean world, India and Africa, Arabia gave Islam the avenues for its expansion. The caravan routes crossing the desert, the sea routes traveled by the Arab Dows that were absolute masters of the Indian Ocean for centuries. Fishing, trade, cattle raising, and agriculture were the main sources of revenue for the sultanates that fought to dominate the region until the British took control at the beginning of the 19th century. The discovery of the first oil fields in 1932 ushered in a new age for the region. The exploitation, rather modest at first, accelerated greatly towards the end of the 1950s. In a few years, the world of the Bedouin dissolved in a sea of petrodollars. Seven sultanates, including Abu Dhabi and Dubai, became independent and formed the United Arab Emirates. For the newly founded federation, as for Oman, which also became independent in the early 1970s, it was the beginning of a new era. The age-old trade routes were abandoned, and cities of glass and steel sprouted up from the desert sands. This is no mirage. Dubai is a real city. In less than 20 years, hundreds of buildings have sprung up from the desert sands like so many 21st century towers of Babel soaring upwards to conquer the heavens. The oil will run out in 20 years. The government wants to build a city on the scale of Hong Kong, Singapore or Shanghai. And they're also aiming to increase the population and attract international tourism to Dubai. With the construction of the Burj Al Arab, the Arab Towers Hotel, the Emiratis have found their Eiffel Tower. As soon as it was completed in 2004, this sail-shaped seven-star hotel was adopted as the symbol of the Sultanate. But don't think of visiting it. The hotel is off limits, unless you can afford to reserve a room there. Luxury tourism is one of the trademarks of Dubai, but it's no longer the only market the authorities are targeting. The proof is that they've managed to lure a huge cruise ship into the waters of the Persian Gulf. This is a first. The Classica has even made Dubai its winter home port for the cruises of the Emirates and the Sultanate of Oman. The Bedouins who once inhabited the region have now settled and some of them have become rich merchants with their shops in the souk. But whether it's business, construction, transportation, fishing, or the textile industry, the Emiratis need the helping hands of immigrants from neighboring countries. These guest workers make up more than 85% of the Emirates' total population. In a word, they are the ones who keep the economy running. Thank you. 
The immigrants come from all corners of the Muslim world. There are Palestinians, Egyptians, Syrians, Lebanese, but the most numerous are the Pakistanis and Indians. You're working in small homes, Pakistanis and Indians, mixed. Mixed working, so many people is working in Pakistan, come from Pakistan. These come from Oman, too much fish is coming from Oman. Arabic people is buying uh, too much big fish in kind of, uh, how more like uh, kingfish and like with big fish, buying big, big fish and Indian people is buying small fish, small kind of fish. Far from the bustling crowds of the fish markets and souks, the pure lines of the Emirate Towers stand out against the blue sky, a twin statement of the country's ambitions for the future. Dubai hopes to rival Shanghai and Hong Kong, so it's no coincidence that today, the Emirate, along with China, is the world's largest construction site. To carry out this ambitious program, they of course have to resort to a lot of imported labor and brain power. European and American architectural offices have set up shop in Dubai to be in pole position for the new building projects that are being launched here almost every day. One of the biggest building projects right now is the Burj Dubai Tower. Its height of 800 meters will soon make it the tallest building in the world. I think this tower will go to 170, 180 stories. It seems that there are only two people within MR, the developer building this complex, who know the final height of the tower. No project is too far out for Dubai. Gigantic towers, artificial islands like the Palm Islands that will soon house 22 hotels and 400 villas. Or the world, which will form a map of the world on the surface of the sea, thus offering millionaires the possibility of buying England, France or Australia. Mehdi lives part-time in both Paris and Dubai. His office was awarded the contract for a gold souk that will be built at the foot of the Burj Dubai Tower. The project's theme is the many splendors of the East, evoked through a profusion of luxury and glitter. Be all the, preparing all the samples. And for size. For size. And we control all the qualities for samples. And uh, we, design a, we design or redesign art walls and detail design. I think that Dubai will continue developing up until 2015, 2020, because they've realized that the hotels, housing and offices won't be enough. So they've embarked upon a new direction now, building water parks, huge leisure complexes, so that anyone coming to Dubai will have enough to keep them busy. Uh, d'équipement pour passer le temps. In line with this policy is the Dome, which opened a few months ago. It's a winter sports resort, 400 meters long. The Emiratis themselves are not flocking to the slopes yet. They're watching the show from the shopping mall. Most of the customers are Europeans living in Dubai or immigrants working in other Gulf countries. We enjoyed a lot. Quite fun. Children are enjoying. 
How the adults are enjoying? We feel, we feel very fun in welcoming to Dubai, and we enjoyed here very much. Dubai is resolutely committed to the future. But if you make a little visit to the creek, an inlet about 10 kilometers long that separates the city in two halves, you'll get a sample of the bustling atmosphere so typical of Middle Eastern cities. As the day draws to a close, Dozens and dozens of abras, small wooden taxi boats, bob along like tiny insects at the foot of the buildings lining the shores of the creek. Immigrant workers commute across the creek, and it is a favorite tourist site. It's also the channel where the Dows arrive, the broad-beamed ships that have been transporting cargo across the Indian Ocean for centuries. The Dows belong to Dubai's big ship owners and merchants, but the crew is usually from Pakistan. Back home, there's no work, or if there is, it pays hardly anything. What we earn in a month isn't enough to support our families. That's why we put up with the hardship of leaving our country and coming to work here. It's sad, but it's the only way for us to support our families and keep them from going needy. On the route to Somalia, we sometimes run into pirates. What they're mostly after is the navigation instruments and the life jackets, everything on board that ensures our safety. When they approach the boat, they signal for us to stop, and if we don't, they shoot at us. We have no chance of escaping. There are two sorts of risk, the storms and waves. We're not well enough equipped to deal with that. And the pirates. In fact, our chances of arriving safely at our destination are very slim. The next morning, we head out of Dubai. As we leave the port, we sail by the construction site of Palm de Ira, man-made islands that form a palm tree and cover 80 square kilometers. In a few years, they'll be covered with 8,000 villas. Dubai's skyscrapers slowly fade into the horizon. We head west for Bahrain. While the Classica follows her route across the Persian Gulf, life on board slips into its cruising mode. Yeah, 
Tout ensemble pour cette croisière avec notre commandant et les officiers la saint dieu tout en tant que all together. Signore et signori, salute! Santé, cheers, tout When morning comes, we're approaching Manama, the capital of Bahrain. You're not aware of it when you arrive by the sea, but Bahrain is an island. An island with a string attached, the King Fad Causeway, a 26 kilometer long bridge connecting Bahrain to the mainland and its powerful neighbor, Saudi Arabia. Oil changed the fate of Bahrain, but unlike the Emirates, its reserves are limited, so the country has chosen to invest heavily in industrialization. Revenue from black gold has not gone to growing a forest of skyscrapers above the low houses of the city. Manama is not Dubai. Yet one gets the feeling that all the Gulf capitals are engaged in a kind of unspoken contest to build the highest and or most extravagant building in the world. And Bahrain is certainly in the running. Perhaps one day Bahrain will have its own landmark skyscraper. But in the meantime, this monument, a pearl displayed in its setting, is the best evocation of the country's history. Like all the cities of the Gulf, Manama's history has been strongly marked by trade. For centuries, the city was a port of call on the routes to Iraq, Iran, Kuwait, and the Sultanate of Oman. The dhows plied along the coasts, transporting a variety of cargo, goats, camels, fruit, vegetables, and of course the colorful spices that still adorn the stands in Manama's souk. Well before the discovery of oil, Bahrain drew its wealth from another natural resource that goes back to ancient times. The mixture of fresh water from underground rivers with the brackish water where oysters thrive gives rise to a particular condition that gives the pearls of Bahrain matchless colors and luster. The arrival of Japanese cultured pearls in 1960 was naturally a staggering blow for the market. But for the jewelers of the souk, the finest pearls in the world are still those from Bahrain. I'm not a diver, but the divers come to me and I deal with them. Of course, the value of a pearl depends on its weight and the variety, if it's clean or if it has rough spots. I buy them according to their weight, but the weight varies. We don't weigh the pearls with these scales anymore, but with this one, a more modern way to weigh them. 
For 100 years, we used that one. Now we weigh them like this. You have to have experience. You have to look at the pearl and observe if it shines. Does it have any rough spots or blemishes? Is it nice and round? This one, for example, has a few flaws, but I have others that are perfect. There are no professional pearl fishermen anymore. Those days are gone. Nostalgia, habit, passion, and hope of finding the perfect pearl, there are still a handful of old timers like Jasya who continue to dive for pearls off the coast of Manama. Things have changed since the time my father used to go fishing and what I do today. I go out because I like to do it. Nobody's making me do it. My father had to die for oysters to feed us, me and the whole family. Back then, there wasn't any oil. We had nothing. So he had to go pearl diving to be able to eat. In the heyday of the pearl industry in the 1930s, more than 2,500 dows, the traditional boats of the Gulf, would head out from the ports of Bahrain every day. Superstition, a real knowledge of the seabed, each captain would take his boat to his own favorite and secret spot. Wherever the spot, there were always dozens of divers piled into each one of the boats, and they did their dives in shark-infested waters. We leave from here to go out fishing. We go for an hour, an hour and a half. Sometimes we dive down four or five meters. You take the oysters, come back up, then go back down again. When you're down there, you don't pick and choose. No, you take everything. When you're down there, you can't tell which oyster might have a pearl. That's up to God. Maybe the pearl is in the one you leave behind. So you take everything within reach. Sometimes you can gather three or four hundred oysters and not find a thing. Other times, out of a hundred or even fifty, you can come upon a pearl that could net you four thousand, five thousand dinars. That much in one single oyster. Of course, I have my secret spots, but I don't tell anyone about them. You can't just go and tell someone, go to such and such a spot and you'll find oysters. That's out of the question. Our day in Bahrain is ending. Passengers are back on board, and the Classica continues its voyage through the Persian Gulf. At daybreak, we're coming into Abu Dhabi. In 1958, when they started exploiting oil, Abu Dhabi was no more than a sparsely populated emirate, inhabited by fishermen and Bedouins. The oil reserves turned out to be so vast, more than 60% of the United Arab Emirates' resources, that Abu Dhabi is now the richest and therefore most influential member. In just a few years, the historic maritime routes used for centuries by Arab navigators have become superhighways for oil tankers. A large share of the black gold oil shipped to Europe and the United States passes through the Strait of Ormus. 
so it's one of the most strategically important spots in the world. There's a lot of sea traffic in this region, most of it oil tankers. It's mainly concentrated in the Strait of Hormuz. A good number of ships just anchor south of the Strait of Hormuz. At any given time, there is an average of 100 to 120 tankers anchored in that zone. They stay there and offload the cargo onto smaller ships. Yes, it's a zone where there's a lot of traffic. The economic and financial stakes involved in oil are so important for both the producer and consumer countries that despite the tensions and conflicts that have plagued the region, the zone around the Emirates has always enjoyed a relative calm. But the danger is ever present, and the risks were surely carefully weighed and evaluated when the Classical was preparing to come and offer its cruises in the region. Logicamente, se guardiamo l'area un Yes, in a strictly logical sense, um, you could consider this to be a risk zone. This region could very well be the target of a terrorist attack, that's true. But if you take a closer look at the countries of Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, no, I, I don't think there's any risk. You know, the countries have done a lot over the past few years to attract tourism. And, of course, along with that, they've done everything necessary to make the region safe. No, I, I don't think it's uh, very dangerous for us to be in this zone right now. We have to take a special measure in some ports, like to treat that port as uh, threat level two. We have all the security measures concerning threat level two, so we increase our security. We increase, we keep one security, one guard at the back of the ship and then front. The water side is monitored. There is a special fence outside, so no vehicles can come closer. Everything is monitored. Oil leaves the country by sea, but the fruit and vegetables are shipped in by road. Every day, hundreds of trucks from Kuwait, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan cross the Arabian desert. Most of the fruit on sale in this market, is it a wholesale or retail market, hard to tell, 
comes from far off countries with just one exception, dates. The date palm is known as the queen of the oasis and therefore of the desert. For the Emiratis, the date is much more than a fruit. It's a reminder of their Bedouin roots. Even though they may not live in tents anymore, the date is still an essential part of their lives. But, and this is a sign of the times, the Emiratis, thanks to improvements in the transportation system, now have a choice among countless varieties, all grown in the Gulf region. We import from Saudi Arabia, Oman, and Iraq, Iran. Yeah, we have the uh, Abu Dhabi dates like this, the black one. Yeah. No, and uh, the packets like like the packets. Pakistan, Indian, and uh, Arabian people, all people buy the dates from Saudi Arabia. More people are buying Saudi Arabia dates. And uh, we have the local dates, uh, some like this like that, and Iraq dates. It took 10 years for Abu Dhabi to recover from the sociological shock caused by the sudden influx of oil wealth and to change from a society rooted in the Middle Ages to a modern one, 10 years before the population began to get their piece of the action, which had previously remained firmly in the hands of the ruler. This doesn't mean that Abu Dhabi has become a democratic society. The standard of living has improved immensely but that doesn't apply to the immigrant workers who still make up 80% of the population. The fact is that despite appearances, Abu Dhabi has maintained a tribal way of life. The sovereign is all powerful. His subjects respect him, venerate him, and pray to God that he may continue enriching the members of his tribe. Abu Dhabi is the largest and most populated emirate. It's the keystone of the union and the main economic power. And this is thanks to the modernization policy undertaken by our sovereign. His Majesty Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Hayyan. May God protect him. And the heir to the throne, His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Hayyan. The quiet little village of fishermen and Bedouins that existed here 50 years ago has disappeared. So completely that across from the string of high-rise buildings on the shore, they've reconstructed an entire traditional village to show the tourists and young Emiratis what life used to be like in Abu Dhabi, not five centuries ago or two centuries ago or even one century ago, but a mere 50 years ago. Even the United States, which is often cited as an example of rapid development, never underwent such a drastic change. Islam is undoubtedly the only social glue that remains, the last bridge connecting the generations. The muezzin's cry calling the faithful to prayers, which in the old days would be carried off by the desert winds, now echoes off the glass facades of the buildings surrounding the mosques.
We're leaving Abu Dhabi and heading east to the Gulf of Oman and the little emirate of Fujaira. Dubai, Manama, Abu Dhabi, Discovering each one of these leading cities of the Middle East is rather disconcerting in the end. Of course, one admires the architectural wonders, but it's something like visiting an exhibit where all the works were produced from the same mold. The old cities with their time-honored history have a soul that's missing from the new cities that are only a few decades old. What will they be like in a century? Only time will tell. Fujairah, which is one of the smallest and least wealthy of the seven emirates, presents a completely different picture. We find a little town nestled between sea, mountain, and desert, a city where the spirit of the past continues to breathe. This is one of the oldest mosques on the Arabian Peninsula. With its simple lines, it recalls the Sahelian mosques in Africa, particularly those of Timbuktu, Jenne, and Gao, Fujaira is striving to modernize, but it still has a way to go. The city's true riches lie elsewhere. In this fortress, symbol of the local chieftain's power before Fujaira became a British protectorate. There's a project underway to reconstruct the village that once surrounded the fortress using traditional materials and methods. Architect is heading the project. The people of 100 years age are still living here. We approach them uh, from the museum. We, the staff of a museum, we go to them, we ask them how it was and what it was. And obviously, first, first building was, was the fort only. That was for uh, uh, defense purpose, and in the emergency time when there was some troubles or in some fightings, uh, the ruler family used to live inside the fort. the material especially the, which they used to do was very locally produced. They, it is made from mud bricks, or raw mud bricks, clay. So still we use the same material. The flat roofs which you see around here are uh, meant for the royal family. But these hut type houses, they, they call it Kareem. In Arabic, they call it Kareem. So these houses were 
especially for the servants who were working for the sheikh. But when the family is extended, but they have more children, they, the children used to spend uh, some time with the, with, the, with the servants or with the guards in these houses. During the night, we've made our way to Muscat, the capital of the Sultanate of Oman. In the early morning light, Muscat looks like something straight out of a pirate story, or the voyages of Sinbad the Sailor, a hero of the Thousand and One Nights. The city, of course, has been modernized, but it's still a far cry from the super cities of Dubai and Abu Dhabi. In Muscat, the white buildings don't soar to challenge the heavens, but are harmoniously and respectfully integrated into the existing cityscape. Before 1970, Muscat was a small, a walled city surrounded by a wall. And that's where the ministries, the government houses were. But our present Sultan, that is his most, is he converted the country, Oman, in 37 years from a very backward country into a, a modern country competing with cities around the world. Now today, you know, Muscat is, is different, it's a metropolis, it's opened up different areas. And I think the progress of, of the cities is great, the history is rich. Going back 150 million years, the dinosaur age, to date. That's why we try to keep it a good blend of tradition and our culture, which is not, is the same as it was before. Muscat has a relaxed, easy way of life. You can feel it wherever you go, along the beaches, as well as in the Mutra fish market, the city's fishing port and business center. The atmosphere that reigns in Muscat, and more generally throughout the entire Sultanate of Oman, is the fruit of a long history. The history of a land 
open to the rest of the world thanks to its seafarers who crisscrossed the Indian Ocean for many centuries. In the 18th century, Muscat even possessed an African empire with Zanzibar in East Africa as its prized possession. Muscat still has traces of those exchanges with the world, like here in the Indian style of the houses along the Mutra waterfront. But Oman has remained intrinsically oriental. Here, time doesn't count. Just linger around the souk for a while, and you'll see what we mean. The Mutra Souk is much more than a market where one buys Indian silks or incense from Dofar province. It's a meeting place, a vast social club. The aisles of the Mutra Souk are like an echo of the maritime routes that connected Oman to the rest of the world down through its long history. Oman, a cultural crossroads, one of the richest and most colorful in the world.